Hi there and welcome to Get The Point. I'm Dave Fleming and we have such a special treat tonight that I had to break this show into two parts. Yes, yeah, so part one will air tonight and then part two will air in two weeks from the night. Let's dive right into it. Thanks for watching. All right, everybody, welcome to Get the Point. I'm Dave Fleming, and boy, am I excited for this week's show because I have a legend of the game joining me. This is going to be awesome. You're going to get so many good tips and inside information. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Get the Point, Scott Moore. Scott, how are you? Thanks so much for joining us. Dave, it's my pleasure to be with you. I'm great. I am uh, sitting here. My new house, looking out of the mountains and a little snow covered and uh, got a little pickleball in earlier. So heading to Newport Beach tomorrow. So life is really good. Thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to jump into the points in just a second after these words from our sponsors. <laughs> Welcome back to Get the Point. I'm here with Scott Moore, and we're going to dive into a couple of matches that Scott played at the Delray Beach Open on the stadium courts. And the first match we're going to look at is a men's doubles match. We've got Scott with his back to me in the white. His partner is Rick Witzkin, who's ready to receive serve in the green shirt. On the far end, you have Jaime Anschens and Steve Kennedy is about to serve. All right. So what happened there, you know, Rick made Jaime move. So he got his third shot a little high. And I was able to take it out of the air and be a little aggressive, even though it's my backhand. Caught Steve back and he popped it up. Now, I was aiming for the right foot there and hit the left, but uh, hitting it into their feet is kind of what you want to do, right? So keeping it down low on them, we were able to execute that and uh, basically point one for us. So what, what, I'm going to ask you a couple of things about this point. Uh, okay. Let's start with, uh, you know, you're talking to somebody who loves to hit a two-handed backhand and you made the decision on this ball that you mentioned was a little high off Jaime's paddle. Why the two-hander here versus the one hand on that ball right there? Yeah, well, you're, you're the master at that, but I have been playing more and more with it on high balls where I can actually get a little more top spin. Just gives me a little more power and control. Um, you know, I've been watching the, the ladies do it for years, and I'm a slow learner, but I've been working <laughs> steady on it. So on, on higher balls now, I'm being more aggressive and going to two hands just for that extra le level of control and power that I get from it. Yeah, so folks, in less than seven minutes of the show, you have heard a legend of the game saying he's working on and learning two things. You can never stop learning in this sport. The other thing you mentioned is the location of the put away ball. You said, I was aiming for the right foot, caught the left foot, obviously still hit down in a winner. Tell our viewers why right foot, left foot, and what you were thinking. There. Well, you know, I was being a little facetious, but basically what I'm doing on an attackable ball is usually going toward the person who's closer to me, right? High mate, if you notice, is closer in the court. So that is my target. Now, I'm not trying to hit anybody, but getting it into their feet 
is usually a very tough ball to dig out, especially if I have that kind of angle on it. And, you know, I call it painting the toenails. So hate to have that happen to me. Love to do that to other guys or, you know, um, when that opportunity presents itself. So that's really what I'm trying to do. If there's an opening, which there wasn't, I'm trying to hit through the opening. If there's no opening, they're pretty much covering the court well, then I'm going hard at the feet, you know, right around there, just making it really difficult for them to, to dig it out. If, even if they do dig it out, it's probably going to come back high and I get another opportunity to be offensive with the shot. Let's jump into, uh, this was a great match. Uh, a lot of good hand battles at, at the net. Walk us through this. And before I get started, huh, somebody's spinning the ball on their serve here. Tell me about that before you hit it. Is that something you're working on? Obviously, new rules this year in new play rule. in APP. Right. Old dogs can learn new tricks. So I am practicing spin serve, obviously, you know, Zane Navratil kind of put it out there and I'm watching it going, you know, I need an edge. I'm not getting any younger, but I can get better if I can learn a few new tricks. So this is one of them to get an additional significant amount of top spin or side spin, depending on how you spin it off your paddle. So um, I've really been working on that a lot, especially this week. Um, as much or more maybe for my singles to really get them back. Because as you know, in singles, you got to be a little more aggressive. But I also like it in doubles. It just jumps enough to make their returns often end up shorter in the court, helping my third shot or my partners and, you know, therefore giving us a higher probability of winning the point. So, yes, definitely one of the new things I'm working on right now. Love it. Yeah. Lots of people flipping that serve and using that paddle and so forth. It's going to be fun. I love innovation and I love seeing players at all levels working on it. And everyone at home should be trying that as best you can and try that drop serve as well. Lots of things you can do with that. So here we go. Uh, walk us through this. There's going to be a lot of shots, a lot of balls ripped at the kitchen line. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm trying to get a deep serve. I may get a nice return here. Rick decides to go ahead and drive it. I'm ready. Got it a little high though. So Rick caught back there. Jaime takes a big backswing. And he gets it, but gets it down in Rick's feet. Really, really nice. Now we got a little cross court battle going with Steve and Rick. They're keeping that ball unattackable and really nice dink in there going back and forth. That one got into Rick's feet a little. So Jaime got to attack it. I was able to cut it off. Here we go. Now we're backing up. I don't like that, but we were fortunate that Rick was able to get it down low enough that Jaime caught the, the tape with it. And we were fortunate enough to win that exchange. So I think uh, a couple things from your description of what we saw here, it was the, I don't like that we were backing off. And in fact, in this point, typically the people that are backing off in those exchanges are going to lose it because you're, right you're the person on top of the net is hitting the ball sooner you're farther back there's so much more difficult to get out of that reset it uh rick did hit a remarkable shot as he was backing up but describe as we watch this again why from your perspective backing up even when you're in one of those quick hand battles you just shouldn't be backing off yeah well i just think you know your hands are quicker than your feet so when you're backing up you know you're on your heels a little bit and especially if you're hitting it hard and backing up it just gives them more time so if you're going to back up i would say that should be only in a reset type scenario where you really try to get it low and then get back in there so you know we were able to somehow fight that off and Rick got that last ball pretty low, even though he hit it maybe a little harder than he, he might have wanted to. Um, Jaime, you know, caught it and just like I said, wasn't able to hit down on it like he wanted to. And we were fortunate to, you know, get out of that point. But yeah, I, I just I just believe in staying up there, resetting with your hands rather than trying to do it with your feet. You know, a lot of people are backing up now, but you'll notice when they back up, they're primarily going defensive with that. And I think that's fine to get yourself back in the point but I want to back up before the ball gets to me, not during the time when I'm hitting the ball so that my momentum is all going forward. Yeah, so I have it frozen here on uh, Rick's position. And most of the time when you are giving ground, 
I agree. I like to take a defensive posture and just lay that back in the kitchen if possible, and then come back and, you know, start hopefully the 50 50 battle as we saw right. at the beginning of this point with the dink battle. And then hopefully we get one up and we've overcome the attack, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. Because positionally, I like their position on the court better than ours right now, just because you can see, you know, Rick is kind of up standing up and, and a little bit further back in the court than I think he would like to be as well. Yeah, and sometimes the tape is your friend and that right. one was just barely into the tape, but you know, that's what happens. But I think the message to everyone watching is your hands are faster than your feet is a great, a great takeaway from everybody. And if you retreat, work on this and drill this. If you retreat when you're getting attacked, work on just dropping that ball back into the kitchen. We want to get to neutral there, not try and win from swinging volleys from the non-volley zone five feet back. Take us through this one. Okay. So we're serving. And before you hit this third, uh, people ask me a lot, and I think uh, your perspective will be great. In a men's match where you have two, well, you have four great players on the court. I was just saying you have two great players on the other side. Do you have a philosophy of where that third shot should go if it's in a fairly neutral position? You got to return down the middle. You could do a variety of things. Some people say always hit it to the guy that returned it because they're advancing. Do you have a point of view on that? that yeah, actually I on? do. And, you know, when I'm teaching, you know, intermediates, I do tell them to hit it to the guy who's advancing because a lot of times he, he or she is still on the move, right? But at the pro level, I find almost all the time that, you know, they're already in the kitchen. They're quicker and the returns are a little deeper or higher. And so even now as I'm hitting the ball, you know, they're both pretty much up there. So in this scenario, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I mean, my tendency would be with my forehand to drive it a little more, my backhand to drop it a little more. And I would, my tendency would be to go to, to their backhands more often than not. But I also like to be unpredictable and kind of mix it up a little bit. Sure. So yeah, if you keep throwing it in the same place every time, you're taking away any advantage that you have of the variety right. of shots you certainly have. So I think that's right. a great point. Right. So, the other, the other, uh, the other actual confession is I have no clue what I did with this one. So. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Edging uh, my best. good news is you did do something you just talked about. All right. So I got it. I got a drop into his backhand. I like that, which got me to the net. I like that. So I've neutralized their advantage. Right now we're in a dink exchange cross court, which I like. Just hope waiting for an opportunity. Steve's making it tough for me, making me bend down. I'm trying to make him bend over as well. Now I'm going to attack it because it's on my forehand side. I'm thinking it may not be expected. And that one caught him off guard. I was fortunate because not all of them do. He's pretty tough on those, but you got you to gotta pick your timing. And that one, for whatever reason, he just wasn't quite expecting it. Yeah, so it... It's, it's wild how just one that just barely clips the net like that sort of throws the rhythm of a, of a point off. Yeah, I think that's exactly what happened, Dave, because, you know, he just stood up and, it, you know, for whatever reason, because that happened, he wasn't expecting a hard ball. And so I, I was able to sneak it in on him and, and catch him off guard. Are you, you know, we, we talk a lot on this show and when I'm teaching and when I'm talking to players that, are advancing to higher levels that hitting it hard is one thing, but accuracy and where you hit it hard is even more important. Where, obviously you won the point and crossed up a very good player there. So when you have a ball like that, that unexpectedly does sit there for your best shot, which is that forehand in the middle, are, where are you aiming on Steve to yeah. get him to do yeah. that? Yeah, so if I'm going hard, you know, there's just not any room on his backhand side. You know, I'm going to hit it out unless I just hit a perfect shot. So I'm going more into the body, hoping to catch, you know, that proverbial chicken wing type place where it's going to stay in. If it misses him, it's going to catch him a little off guard in that awkward zone. And, you know, 
even if it's going out, it may catch his shoulder or, you know, he may not be able to get out of the way, which is kind of what happened there. Um, so that's the normal place where I would attack right into the, into the body, kind of that awkward area that's hard to defend on the forehand side or underarm of the forehand side. So we hear the term chicken wing all the time. For anyone that might be a new player watching this, can you just sort of describe what you mean by that? Uh, yeah, Scott? it's just kind of an awkward area under your armpit of your paddle side hand. So if you're right-handed, it's your right side where, you know, almost to your right hip, it's just much easier to hit a backhand. But then that place where you shift over and try to get a forehand, you sort of jam yourself. So it's kind of being handcuffed, if you will, or jamming where you're jammed. And that's where you're aiming at that place. It's just hard to hit a backhand because you have to come so far over and it's hard to transition onto a forehand because it's jamming into your body. So it's right there that I'm talking about. The chicken wing. Yeah. And the other thing that just delivers the chicken wing on most players is, as you can see in this, everyone is holding a backhand. So they have that backhand posture as well. So to be able to flip that into where you're talking about is really difficult. So you'll get people doing the windshield wiper thing too. And so that's a great place to attack. Yep. People ask me a lot, and I'd love your perspective, Scott. Should I be trying to attack knowing that it's out, but I'm trying to hit them? Or do I want to attack and make sure that this ball will be in if they dodge it? Yeah, I, I think that it's the latter. I mean, you know, like I said, I don't really try to hit people. But, you know, if their body happens to get in the way of a ball that is going in anyway, I, I look at it as, hey, I'm going to win the point either way. Yeah. If it happens to hit them, or, or even if it doesn't, because a lot of people are really great at dodging the ball as you know they're pretty really quick and so I don't want to gamble on trying to hit someone and therefore I want it to go in either way um, and that to me is just is just good percentage pickleball yeah so obviously if there's two ways to win the point that is way better than hitting a ball long and losing it uh, right. so folks when you're practicing this and drilling it I think the big thing is is the attack is good but make sure that attack that ball that's up is going to be in off your paddle. Really good advice from Scott there. All right, let's jump into another one. Uh, you may not like this one a lot, but uh, you guys are just going to be under siege here. And uh, it happens, unfortunately. It happens. And uh, let's let's walk through this one. All right. Okay, nice drive serve. Rick gets a really good drop shot. Steve catches the net. So we're on our heels a little bit now. He's pushed Rick back. We got the fast one. I'm caught off guard a little bit, get it a little higher than I want. Same thing there. I'm trying to reset, but getting it up a little higher than I want to. That one was a little better, but now they got us back and all of a sudden, you know, we weren't able to reset that last one as effectively as we wanted to. Got it up. Steve got his forehand and we're pretty much sitting ducks at that point. So obviously this happens to every player at every level. You get under attack. Right. Is there something you wish the two of you would have been able to do differently when you when you see this again? Well, I just wish that, you know, we had been able to soften it a little bit more. I mean, you know, we, we kept getting balls a little higher. And I think Rick, you know, backed up a little bit more on that one than maybe he should have. And therefore, you know, it makes it just harder to reset, I think, even from back there. But, but basically, you know, they, to their credit, never let the pressure off of us. And we were not able to neutralize their advantage at any time during that point. Even though we made them hit five balls, which is better than none, you know, because they still got to make them, but they were making them and we weren't able to quite soften it enough. They still are hitting down on those balls. Right. And for the most part. And so there I'm trying to do it again. This one worked pretty well because Steve missed it, got time his backhand, but I may was ready and he got it down pretty low on Rick's feet. And therefore we just couldn't neutralize the point. Yeah, uh, 
they they caught you a bit on that chicken wing we just talked about there so that's yeah, a good did. attack and it got uh, into my body and and you know i just couldn't quite sometimes it's it's more effective to kind of get it high i was looking for lower balls yeah. you know trying protecting my feet but they got it up into my navel and above and so those had me kind of pulling up on it a little more than i like to i'm a little more comfortable resetting from down around my knees sometimes yeah, can you speak more about that? Because I know there's a lot of people that teach that, you know, attack up because people react, their paddle can't be in a position that keeps the ball reset a way they like. Is that something you try to do when you attack as well, Scott? Yeah, I think, Dave, the more the more I've played over the years, the, the better people are at digging balls out and the lower their center of gravity is getting. I mean, some of these, you know, girls look like they're just, you know, in tune with the court they're so low i mean they're just down way 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 down so you can't almost get it under them and they're ready so much for that low ball that the best way to get them sometimes even if you don't hit it quite as hard is to get it a little up on their body because then they got to bring it from way down to way up you know in the old days people stood up straight and you could get them get, get the ball down below their paddle but now that's tougher and tougher to do so i think again a little bit of variety not doing it all the time so that they're ready for it but changing it up, you know, being unpredictable, going high sometimes and then low other times is a great way to do it. And that's what I try to do, be as unpredictable as possible. Yeah. And again, obviously, when you attack high, there's got to be pace taken off of that ball because, again, we want that to be in. So if you flick right. that at somebody, you got to find you got to make that. You got to go 80 percent or 70 percent, right? Because otherwise you're going to hit it out. And a lot of guys like we talked about are so quick they can dodge it if it's going out. Fundamentally, what are you what are you thinking about on returns when when you're returning on that side of the court? Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking, OK, which one of the guys is hurting us? You know, is one guy coming in and poaching a lot? Um, which in this case, I think Jaime's in a better position to poach because his forehand's in the middle and he was hitting, you know, really nice drops and getting them in. So I think we were primarily returning to Steve. He was giving us drives, which I prefer to get a drive and allow me to, you know, to try to be aggressive with it because it's, it's going to be higher on my body normally if I'm ready for it and can get a good return. So that's, kind of what I was thinking going into most of the returns that I was hitting. And let's talk about, because sometimes it's counterintuitive that, wait, that guy is the one I'm worried about. Why am I hitting him the ball? But it's actually what you want to do. So if there's somebody that's aggressively poaching, tell, tell everybody what you're going to do to stop. That if somebody's killing us poaching, then I'm going to, I'm going to send the return back to them because that makes them hit the shot and stay back. And uh, so, you know, Jaime is, he is really tall and good, but he, he's, he's more of a control player than a power player, right? So he was just being more consistent on the, on the drops. And then Steve was actually the one that was coming in aggressively and hurting us sometimes. So, um, yeah, so you got to kind of change it depending on what's happening. And um, so we, we, we did mix it up, but the tendency was to hit it to Steve for the returns most of the time. Got it. All right, let's see what happens here. So I did try to hit it to Steve, but Jaime took it, right? But now he's a little bit out of position. So we have a, a little advantage, although he made a great shot there. And because he neutralized it so well, he wasn't expecting my next ball to be hard. And that's why I decided, I think, to go ahead and attack it, hoping that he would not expect it because they really did a good job of being off balance and now he's neutralized stuff. So he thinks it's a dink coming and I was able to catch him off guard with that because he had so effectively neutralized it and just didn't expect the next one to be hard. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna pause, look at that paddle position. Jaime's reading a forehand off that paddle position and right. you flick it right back. You've talked about disguise a lot in this. Is this something you practice, Scott? Because look at look at that right there as we have it paused. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's happened is, for better or for worse, you know, with me, because I have a lot of videos out there and you know matches, guys have kind of scouted me, and my tendencies were just basically 
so well known that I've had, and the guys are, have gotten so much better that I've had to go back and kind of reinvent myself. So this is a shot that I never had until the last year, basically the inside out forehand off of a dink, especially. So yeah, I work on that kind of stuff all the time with my training partners. I train more than I play working on new things so that hopefully I can, you know, incorporate them into matches. And this is one, um, you know, case where you caught me on a, on, on learning a new trick and, and it working effectively there. Thanks so much for watching everybody. We will be back with part two with Scott Moore on the next Get The Point and we'll be looking at a mixed doubles match. Until then, please go to the APP TV YouTube channel and subscribe so you get notifications for all the great content on there. Lauren McLaughlin has a wonderful show on there and the tables are turned on me because I will be her next guest and you can find out about all the wild stuff I've done in my life. Yes, we're going to talk about the band Kiss. So please subscribe. You'll also get incredible tips to help your game from Coach Dominic Catalano. There's a show from Jennifer Lucor and a cooking show from Adam Stone and Corinne Carr. Thanks so much for watching. Peace.